Thank you so much. I just want to begin with, with some prayers. Om Agyanti Marandasya Gyananjana Sarakaya Chaksun Nadam Yena Tazmai Shi Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manabhistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Sayam Rupakadam Hayam Dadati Sapadantam Namahum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Dinamane Namaste Saraswate Deve Koravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Paschatya Deshu Parine Vanshaka Pataru Vyascha Kripa Sindhu Vaivacha Patitanam Pavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namona Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Garadhar Shri Vasadi Gora Bhakta Vinna Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So again, thank you all so much for being here. It's an honor to be with you. So I was thinking what to, what to uh, bring up tonight for our discussion. And I was thinking about this idea of fear and our responses to fear. And how did I happen to come up with that? Um, we were just in New Orleans visiting our granddaughter, Revati, Gauravani's daughter, Revati, at Tulane University. And uh, the two kind of thing, activity things we did, we went to this Whitney Plantation, which is a plantation. You get a tour, but it's all per, from the perspective of the enslaved people who were there. I don't know if it's the only such plantation that's like that, but um, the whole tour was a, a, from the perspective of the people who were enslaved there and, and how they suffered. So. That was a very uh, striking experience. Then one of the, we were just there for a few a couple days, but then we went to the World War, War II Museum. That was another one, another pow from another direction. My father was in World War II. He was a navigator who flew over Normandy, dropping parachute, parachuters over Normandy. These glider planes that were being flown into these hedges. And they thought they were hedges, but they didn't know there were stone walls under the hedges. So these gliders that were full of men were just exploding as they landed. So just, yeah, so much suffering, so much death, so much living on the edge, so much fear. So um, I guess I was just, I've just been thinking about how fear is such a driving force in the world. And maybe we don't think about it so much, or maybe we do, but, um, you know, so many different kinds of fear. And fear of loss, maybe fear of loss of my little tiny kingdom in the world, or um, maybe fear of being alone, maybe a fear of being broken or disgraced forever, a fear of scarcity or of not having enough, maybe a fear of having done something that can't be fixed, maybe a fear of the whole political world situation fear of death, you know, so, um, yeah, you know, maybe we're not conscious of it so much, but I think we sort of, we carry it, right? Uh, we lock our cars, we lock our apartments, we buy health insurance, car insurance, maybe life insurance, and, uh, you know, in this world we need these things, right? Uh, why? Because there's fear, and so, you know, Fear is maybe all fear is maybe fear of the future. Things can go wrong. So I was thinking maybe we can take a deep breath and consider for a moment which of those fears you might be holding on to right now. Even if your intention is to be here from a place of alignment or peace or um, equanimity, all the beautiful things you said. but. Uh, which of those fears might, might you be holding on to? And can, 
Can you reset that fear by offering some kind of a gentle kindness to yourself or maybe to someone else today or tomorrow? Just kind of breathe and consider that for a few moments. So yeah, so what are the masks or the fears or the shadows that I wear or that maybe follow me, that are not really me? And can we try to reset or, I was thinking, recalibrate, maybe like tuning into a different frequency, you know, seeking a higher frequency today to hear a higher voice or inspiration, not just a you know, meditate for a moment on resetting your compass. Any of you ever hear Gorvani's compass song? It's really beautiful, you know. You've chosen the life of a sailor, my dear. <laughs> well, so resetting the compass, turn your fear today into, into some kind of a blessing day. So yeah, so this path of bhakti is a path of taking shelter. And bhakti is sometimes described as a, a loving responsiveness. I really love that. It's a, you know, it's like there's, I'm not alone here. I'm, I'm in a place of responsiveness to, to so many um, others and ultimately to, to divinity, you know, loving responsiveness to the others in my life and to, to Krishna or God by any name. Right? Um, it's also, bhakti is also defined as, as meditation or upasana that's been saturated with priti or love. Mm. So I really like that definition too. Mm. So I was thinking um, on this topic of fear, I was reminded of, of Ralph Abernathy who was an activist in the civil rights movement and in the midst, midst of, you know, just unprecedented fear, what could possibly happen next? What could possibly go wrong, you know? Um, he said something so wise. He said, uh, we do not know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Mm -hmm. Which I think is so beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, so it's a, it's a really bhakti kind of a perspective. Right? So, yeah, can we hold on to those insurances or assurances, maybe just a little more lightly, knowing that we're also being held by Krishna or by divinity, any name you want to use. And remember, I don't know if you remember the old song, maybe you're all too young to remember, but he's got the whole world in his hands. The whole world. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's another, I think that's another from the civil rights movement, you know, maybe even, you know, at least it was a gospel song. Right? So maybe we say now, she's got the whole world in her hands. But anyway, they've got the whole world in their hands. You know? So I wanted to share a story with you. It's a difficult story, but I wanted to share this with you and, and get your thoughts on, um, on this story. So this story, took place during the Vietnam War. Uh, there was a young couple, and he was called off to the war. And when he left home, his wife was pregnant with, with their first child. And uh, he was gone for a couple of years. And luckily, he lived and came back. And um, the child had been born. And they were so happy to come back. And, you know, they wanted to celebrate, and by their, in their culture, they wanted to give some, make some offerings to the ancestors. So she went into the village to get whatever it was, you know, coconuts and other things to, to make an offering, celebration, gratitude. And um, so while she was gone at the village, he was saying to their little son, he was trying to get their little son to call him daddy. And, uh, you know, 
And so he, he was saying, can, can you call me daddy? <laughs> and the little boy was saying, he's like two, two, maybe three, whatever. And he's saying, you're not my daddy. And, and the father was really shocked. And, and the little boy said, he said, the one who comes at night, that's my daddy. And so, <laughs> so the father, you know, it was, like, it was like an arrow in his heart, you know. Wow, the one who comes at night, that's my daddy. And so he was so broken, he just didn't know how to hold that. He, you know, he was just, and, uh, but it ends up that the back story was that the other children in the village all have daddies. And when, he, when the little boy would ask his mom, where's my daddy, when she would light the lamp in their, in their hut at night, there would be a shadow on the wall, and she would tell him, that's your daddy. So he didn't have a daddy who was coming home, but she told him, that's your daddy. And so he had this idea that the one who came at night, the shadow on the wall, was his daddy. And so this young father was just holding this pain in his heart, didn't know what to do with it. And when his wife came back, he was just, he couldn't speak to her, he couldn't, he didn't or couldn't express what he was feeling. He just left their little um, hut and he went to the bar and he just stayed in the bar and she didn't understand what's wrong. And, and then the next day he just went to the bar, stayed there all day, didn't come back next day. He's not even speaking to his wife, just, and, and she can't understand what's wrong, and he's not expressing it. And each day he's just going to the bar, and this, his pain is growing between them, this gigantic barrier is growing between them. And, you know, they had been so happy, right? He's just come back from the war, and they've been so happy, they were rejoicing. And so finally, after several days of this, his wife just didn't know what to do. And she just went to the river and she just put herself in the river. She just took her life. You know? So then he's, he's left alone with this little child that he barely knew. And then he lights the lamp at night. Trying now he's going to be the sole parent of this child. He lights the lamp at night. And the little boy says, that's my daddy. That shadow on the wall that comes at night, that's my daddy. And the, and the father realized you know, his, his mistake. So I want to ask all of you, I wanted to maybe make this a conversation, a discussion. That who was at fault here? What was the failure here? <coughs> What do you say? Is there a fault? Is there a fault? Um, I just want to say that I'm taking notes on my phone. I want to be very clear that I'm not just texting people. Yeah. <laughs> I do that sometimes and I have the same, oh gosh. <laughs> so, um, and, and uh, is that the inquiry? Are you asking? to respond to this? Yeah, I'm just thinking like this was a failure of something, right? Communication. It was a failure of communication. What, what went wrong here? Um, someone was not seen. Someone was not heard. Well, yeah. I just want to just say that um, I usually have a little chime in my um, fanny pack that I don't have today because I keep giving them away, actually. Um, and so I say I have in my fanny pack my uh, phone and my credit cards and my keys and this chime that reminds me to be curious. Mm. Be um, curious. And so I have really been trying to use curiosity, especially when it feels uncomfortable between me and another person. Mm, beautiful. So that could have been a little bit of a solution in this situation. Beautiful. What else? What, what comes up for you here? There's like a fear of vulnerability. 
fear of vulnerability. Fear of loss, yeah. Fear of loss. Wow. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown. Like what comes next? So maybe if you don't talk about it, you can just like push it off a little longer. Right. So you don't have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Especially in traditional cultures like apparently Vietnam, India can be like that. We won't talk about it. Let's not talk about it. It won't be there. Right? Maybe. Maybe most traditional cultures, many traditional cultures. Mm. What else? I think it's it's scary because it almost feels like that almost that being lonely was more, more like standing in the loneliness was almost more more than like confronting the vulnerability or like the pain surrounding like not being seen or or communication. It's yeah. not fully thought out, but that's kind of what I was just like, wow. Can all this be heard on the audio, maybe? I don't know. Beautiful. So try to speak loudly, because each, each one of you is speaking something so profound. What else? Yes? I was thinking about the parental role in mm -hmm. this, right? There's a child, and the child was the one who said something confusing, mm -hmm. but neither of the adults used their adult role in it wow. to decipher what the child said. Wow. They just made a, an assumption and like didn't dig Assumptions. Into it. That's a very big piece. Mm -hmm. Assumptions. We make a lot of assumptions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for me I I feel this is a reminder of how powerful our minds and thoughts are when we create so many stories and it's all perspective, we make assumptions a lot. Um, I feel like I've had situations like this, not in this extreme, where hearsay, I, I think that someone is upset with me. And then in my head, my mind starts going crazy and chattering so loud, and it just creates and magnifies and magnifies and magnifies, and it's the concept of whatever we focus on grows. It's because our mind is so intense, and like, how can we quiet that so we can actually have what, space? What do you think is an anti antidote to that? Like, you know, maybe that happens at home with family. Maybe it happens at an office. Maybe it happens here. You know, why is Gopi looking at me like that? Is she mad? <laughs> is she mad at me? You know, I mean, what do you think is the antidote to that? I think, I think a lot of yogic practices. Mm -hmm. Focus, focusing on whether it's the drishti or the breath work or meditation, calming, move, focusing on something else so that the, the mind is, can settle so it's not swirling. I would like to say, based on the lion. Carry out. Thank you. The lion of God. <laughs> <laughs> he has got a beautiful man. I <laughs> would just like to say, um, I think a kind of a primal, really deep unconscious primal sense of, I don't mean a survival primal, even if you're an animal or whatever it is, you're in body, sense of acceptance. Because when you don't feel loved or accepted, then you reel up, your mind makes up all these stories, everything. But I feel like sometimes the antidote would be really tuning in to the love of divinity, that you are loved, you are enough, and that you are beautiful, you are worthy. All those very primal narratives that pop to the surface of like, I am loved, I am enough, because I know myself, with what Eric was saying, I, I spin off, and that's the underlying narrative. Uh, and my mind will, will feed, because it doesn't feel like accepted enough, loved, whole, because of, and so that narrative um, 
is impact with the mind. But if I believe and know that not based on the objective of getting the validation from the other person, but knowing that divinity, God, grace is present, and I think when soon as we take away divinity of God, then um, we almost like are left reeling with all this information without a sense of peace. That's really beautiful. That's what I like to call a like bhakti love triangle. You know, you have a love triangle in the material world where you're in relationship with somebody and somebody edges in and you know throws the whole thing off. So that would be like a disaster kind of material love triangle. But um, what I like to call a bhakti love triangle is when when you've got yourself in relationship with this other person. But then you've got divinity there too, because you know, Gopi's a bhakti and she's saying it's about it's about you and God. It's not you it's about you and the other person. But let's go back a little bit before going to the high, high, high bhakti place. What about you and the other person? Um, what could have averted the disaster? Like you said assumptions. We make a lot of assumptions. And sometimes, um, sometimes there's war start because he mm. said, she said, you know, who was it? The, do- the Duke of somebody started world. Somebody said something about the Duke of somewhere, and he started World War One. I forget the history. You know the history. I don't know. He assassinated the Duke. He assassinated the Duke. He assassinated the Duke. Yeah. So, um, what else? What's coming up for you? What else? I yeah. have. Please. Please on. Um, well, what came up for me from the start um, is, and this is between the two, is um, fear, like trumping or allowing fear to overcome love. There is the divine, divine love, but there's also like the love that you have for your child, your family, that they allow their fear to be bigger than that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me, and based on what you said, like when I came out when I was 17, you know, my parents like were very afraid for me. And so they in, wanted to protect you, they yes, loved you. Exactly. But the way that it manifested was not loving, you know, mm-hmm. it felt rejecting almost in a sense because they were so afraid, you know, that it almost like they pushed me away basically. So that came up about that. But th- there was a point that I was going to say I, in one of my classes in grad school, um, there's this quote that stuck with me in all these years. And it was assumptions are just a question that's waiting to be asked. You know, like everybody hears the line, like assumptions make an ass out of you and me, you know, but uh, when I heard this quote, assumption is just a question that's waiting to be asked. I was like, wow, that's real big because, yeah. So what if, yeah, I was thinking that also, you know, like what if she had said, or he had said, I'm thinking this, but is that true? I love you so much, but I'm thinking this, is that, is that what's happening? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, something coming up for me uh, when I think about this, this, this relationship and this man who had just come back from war. And sometimes when you feel like your body is not your own, when it's being used for things that you would necessarily choose on your own, it, um, it does something to your identity that's an issue your I am this. Yeah. And maybe that grief that he had about decisions that he had to make within the you know context of war yeah. might have um, temporarily or permanently um, put pressure on his ability to Yeah. Judge totally skewed judge. his humanity or mm-hmm. his ability to reach out to say, I'm thinking this, is that true? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that um, angst or that kind of animal instinct of fear, maybe as well. I wouldn't put it on him. I'd, I'd say she should be. I mean, what's going on? 
So, so Gopi's saying she because he can just come out for more, and he explains to her. So right. It's not functional, and he doesn't know like. But it's true that, isn't it, that when people come back from war or grief or, ru- or rape or some kind of trauma, the people in our, the, the, their lives don't necessarily know mm-hmm. what that feels like. You know? They don't necessarily know what that trauma feels like. Well, just snap out of it, you know? What's wrong? You know, it's been a year. Get over it. Your baby mm-hmm. died a year ago. You, you can have another baby, mm-hmm. you know, or your dog, or you lost your arm, or whatever. You know what I mean? So sometimes the people we love the most say the most painful wrong things. This is reminding me, so I've been in this, been studying to be a yoga therapist through this angle of, there's a lot of studying of Chinese medicine. And it's there's a beautiful concept which relates to kind of overlaying with the, the throat chakra in communication is that in Chinese medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, the tongue is actually a growth of the heart mm-hmm. and when you visualize mm-hmm. that and when you see that sometimes you realize that if you remember that in all moments our tongue is actually part of the heart then whatever you speak is going to come from the heart and that whether it's bad or not it's like that reminder actually like I've used it before like I've been practicing it where if I'm afraid to speak I see my heart, and it's just like a, an interesting visual reminder that you know that we all need to remember that nothing bad can happen if we speak from the heart because it's such pure vibration. Mm-hmm. But it's an interesting philosophy mm-hmm. from the TCM. Interesting. Mm-hmm. What else? Yes. Um, well, I sort of guess I have a question. I know you're asking the question. But I also have a question as an answer to it. <laughs> and it was just, you know, because I also like the way Gopi was going with, you know, with it being, you know, talking about the, the, the wife, that's kind of where my mind also was a bit. And, you know, when, like, it's almost like, what do you do when, someone else just isn't able to connect to their feelings. Like they just shut down. They mm-hmm. cannot touch the pain. And all they want to do is push you away. Mm-hmm. So if she has no idea why he's in a mood, none. She doesn't know that the child said that at all. So she can't just say, oh, you know what that meant? Nothing. She literally has no clue. So she might have said like I love you you know she could have said all the things that she could have got to say to get him to open up but some people have a lot of trouble opening up you know and and some people run I mean I thought in the story he was just gonna leave like he was just like gonna disappear (laughs) I thought that's where the story was gonna go that he just never came back and some people do that and you don't even get a chance to help them open up to you, you know, it, there's only been so much one person can do. Mm-hmm. What about, you know, when you feel that, like that vast gulf of um, silence or that wall of misunderstanding, what about, there's some way to walk across that, uh, yeah, walk across that wall, that you know, that vast gulf is, is Gopi saying touch, that's a beautiful, oh, you know, or, or sometimes, you know, sometimes you see somebody at your office or maybe here or at home, somebody's just, you can just see they're just holding something and, you know, to just like walk across that gulf and say, um, what's in your heart? What's in your heart? Or whatever you want to say, but Sometimes it, it can just even just be a touch, or it can be a smile, or it can be. Yeah, I remember hearing there's this wonderful Quaker um, teacher. He's written many books and he's a healer, and he he went into a depression, this tremendous depression, and you know all his friends were saying, you know, you're such a great teacher. You've written so many books and you've helped so many people. You're gonna you're gonna snap out of it. Don't worry, you know. And nothing was helping him. 
<laughs> nothing, all of his friends were saying nothing was helping. But he, he said that he had this one friend that was just showing up on Fridays to give him a back rub. And he was like, that was, that was the person who, it was just silence, you know? No words, but just showing up, you know? I actually kind yeah. of agree with that. I feel like the first thing that comes to mind is an energy field space with that person sometimes. Like, they're holding something, and you, when you offer that space without judgment, yeah. um, it allows them to feel that space and sometimes come towards you, like, to touch or... Yeah. But kind of just showing up and, and helping the person feel seen and heard, that's so absent in our culture. This path of bhakti is a path of personalism. And I like to call it radical personalism. Radical noticing. You know, radical noticing because people feel unseen and unheard. You know? But when two people are hurting, it's very difficult to then step out of that field, mm -hmm. to show up in presence and empathy. All you're feeling is your mood and mood. Mm -hmm. And most people are like licking their own wounds. Mm -hmm. yeah. But two people are like bleeding and they're both licking their wounds and they can't like, they're like in that survival mode of licking their wound and trying to heal their own wound before they can step and extend to someone. And that's the usual thing. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're so quick, like I was maybe thinking when you're sleeping, we're so quick to judge when we like feel other people's energy and then to like back off because we're afraid, right? We're afraid because either we're taking it personally or that like just, or we can't handle it, right? Yeah. And I think that there's such a beauty in being able to hold each other in our brokenness, but it takes taking that step. And that step is courageous, like you were saying. Yeah. But what if, so, you know, we're, we're trying to look at this from the perspective of, of bhakti. So um, what if, when I, when I feel an impasse in, in a relationship like that, what if I can go within myself and say a little prayer and then maybe go to that person and, and just say, go be... I think you're thinking this about me, but is that what you're actually thinking? And then, then Gopi maybe has a chance to say, no, I wasn't thinking that at all. Mm. I just like, you know, I came to work today and I had a stomach ache, or, you know, I have a, I have a mock cream, and that was not about you at all. And then I, I oh, wow, thank you, because <laughs> I thought you hated me now. You know, whatever, you know, but just like walking across that, I'm thinking of, I was just down in the south, which I, I just feel a lot of heavy energy there, you know. And I'm thinking of that bridge that's in Selma, Alabama. And I'm just thinking, walking across that bridge and saying, um, did something I say upset you today? And then the person has, well, as a matter of fact, you know, it really did disturb me when that's why they whatever. Or, no, 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 whatever, you know, but we don't, I think we don't do that. I, I think a lot of it is about assumptions, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of, you know, I know people who work in mediation say that one of the biggest causes for problems, you know, is um, people making assumptions, mm -hmm. you know. Renee Brown, she says that a phrase, like a guaranteed phrase to like get you across that bridge is the story I'm telling myself is boom. Yeah, yeah. Because then it takes the onus off the other person for causing these feelings within exactly. you. It's more of that then it's just like I'm telling myself this made up story and this is how it goes. Like <laughs> And is that does that have any reality in exactly. your perspective? And then the person has their chance to mm -hmm. say, Wow, you hit it on the head or no, 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 or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The story. Right. The story I'm telling you. That's right. <laughs> that is the weirdest thing for me to think about. That it's we're so all main weird. characters in our own stories. We're just the main character <laughs> in our own. <laughs> are you an actress? I am. <laughs> <laughs> Not only are we the main character, we're 
we're the <laughs> cinematographer, yeah. oh, we're yes. the editor, right. we're the everything, you know, and we've got our own story. And we don't we don't realize that everybody else has their own story too, you know? So I think coming to a place of authenticity or maybe humility is to think, wow, I'm just you know, I'm just one of the um supporting cast. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm a supporting cast in your story and you're yeah. in mine, but like, I'm the main. And thank you for, thank you for, <laughs> Thank you for being here in my yes, story. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> or you know this philosopher this philosopher Martin Buber talked about the I thou attitude. In other words, we see each other we see other people as objects and I'm gonna use him or her for this or that purpose. But the idea that you know that each one of you I'm 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 beholding you. You are sacred. That's a very bhakti kind of attitude. Yes. I was just going to say what was coming up for me thinking about um, the stories we tell ourselves and how to work through the fear. And certainly, it's, I think, recognizing what the story I'm telling myself might not be true. But I feel like, for me at least, it has to be coming to peace with well, if the story is true. Like the story you told, mm -hmm. you know that there's an misunderstanding but it could just have been that there was you know that that the father's understanding of what the boy said was correct and there had been an affair right and to make peace with this may be true and and I think that ties back a little bit with what you were saying with you about bringing in the divine and getting through even if the thing you are most afraid realizing maybe what's at the root of that, even if that's true, mm -hmm. how to move through that and mm -hmm. accept whatever discomfort or pain you feel, you know, to be able to go past. And it's great if you have that conversation and it ends up not being true, but this way, if you make peace with the thing you're afraid of, then it's, you know, you can take care of it. You yeah. can actually confront it. Yeah. You can feel the pain associated with it. And you can actually talk about it. Mm -hmm. Can, can I add something to what you just said, which I think came up for me when you were saying that meditation? I, I like I love priest. It's not about if it's true or not true. But if we are in tune with perhaps the big why is this happening to me, that there is a way that hand is happening for me and not against me, because we think the world is against us, the world is against us. <coughs> but we actually realize that, you know, I, I, I think about this because I, I feel like when you ask that beginning meditation question of all the fears, I was like tick, 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 tick. They've all hit me in the face already. It's like all those fears that I had 20 years ago, I've met them. I've met every single one of them from being our lungs and being broken from death and this and that. And it's almost like I had to face them. That's why it was coming. It was like, oh, you got to face your fears. And, and what happens in that journey of facing that, if it's true or not true, was a journey of self-discovery. Um, and I think it's a journey of honesty, a journey of uh, giving it to grace, so many aspects. But I felt like, I felt like our fears, the universe will bring our fears to our forefront. Um, um, and if, there's still those fears that are going to come to you. Mm. They'll become a reality because we fear them. We're yeah. attracting them. Yeah, my friend calls it the sledgehammer of God. Mm. Like, I don't like that feeling. <laughs> 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 but like his argument is like, like all he's carving a pie. Like his argument is like <laughs> <laughs> that that that's going to come. It's going to come no matter what. Whatever he's carving for you, or however you. <laughs> something when we had our stores in the metropolitan DC area we used to represent this artist Brian Andreas he made something these, these things called story people they were kind of made of old barns and fences and used to write like different wisdom sayings on them they're kind of like kind of like outsider art like 
maybe a child had done it. <laughs> so the, the most beautiful one that he did, and the most popular one, was this one that, and they kind of had wings on them too, but these like wiry wings. And there's this beautiful one that said, most people don't know that there are <coughs> angels who come into our lives to make sure we don't fall asleep and miss our life. <laughs> and sometimes they come like a sledgehammer. <laughs> sometimes they come with those like flowery wings, but they come. You know? So, um, what do you say to someone who might not have experienced or seen or even feel that they are divinely loved? Like, if you're in a relationship with somebody who has this wall, but you know that they love you. And they might not have access to like this higher, you know, reservoir of love. What do you? You, can, you can be that one person who can change the whole trajectory of a person's life just by a word, just by a smile, just by a noticing. You know, you know. Um, I was listening to this podcast. This. Um, Teacher David Brooks, a beautiful man who writes for the New York Times, who was saying that he had an English teacher when he was in, the, I don't know what, sophomore high school or something, who said to him, David, you think you can get by on just being glib? And, you know, it hurt. It was like, it was an ouch. You know, but then he's like, wow, oh, thank you so much. Because, you know, that kind of changed the trajectory of his life. No, I'm not going to just try to get by on being glib you know, with my big brain or whatever it was. So sometimes you can be that one, that angel who God put there in that person's path. You know, that person sitting on the corner, you know, maybe they've already got the rope. You know, maybe they're about to take their own life. And just by noticing them, it can be something very small or it can be something very large. And you can be that person. Why, why did you happen to cross that person's path at that very moment? So I just tell you, uh, what do you, when do you end here at 8 o'clock? Yeah, a minute between. Yeah, I just had one yeah. thing to say. Yeah. I yes. would say that with COVID and everything, and this may have happened pre COVID and still, but now we realize that there's so much PTSD and mental depression. And maybe if it had happened now, maybe she would have considered that. But pre COVID, most people would not even think about it. So nobody was looking at the, you know, coming from a war and what he was going through. Mm -hmm. And then she, on the other hand, uh, she was doing so much at home to bring him home. And both of them had some mental disorder, not disorder, some mental issue. It didn't need to be that. Yeah, some fears. Now we would, not, some mental, some fears, yes. Mm -hmm. And now it would be simple for people to recognize it. So maybe that's one of the gifts of COVID? <laughs> or maybe, maybe that's one of the reasons for suffering in this world. Like a little slap to wake us up. Because otherwise, we, like the angel story, otherwise we just fall asleep and miss our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, without those little, you know, like, like the cowboy <laughs> Not a little one. <laughs> Okay, maybe. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm just thinking of those, you know, those cowboy movies that we've all seen, you know. Yeah. And the guy's been shot. And his buddy's trying to get him out of the, you know, the place. And, you know, wake up, wake up. They're coming, they're coming. Wake up, you know. Yeah. You know. So maybe that's the reason that Krishna puts suffering in, in our lives, so that we don't fall asleep and, and miss that. You know, what would we say from a bhakti perspective? This is not your home. This world is not your home. You're meant for a much higher life. Krishna's waiting for you. He wants to play with you. His play is not complete until you join his, his play, his dance. So maybe that's, that's a reason. I had some other thoughts. Should I share or should we? Yeah. Uh, I have one yeah? real quick, sorry. Um, so I recently went through like a drawn out breakup and it was incredibly painful and I credit us because we both like took the courage to face the pain head on instead of ignore it and just like snip and cauterize and then be out of each other's lives it was like okay there's real love here and separation and untangling that we have to do like respectful of each other and it was almost the courage 
to face the pain that made the pain worth feeling. I don't know, like, it was every time, like, a wave of grief, like, washed over me, every time, like, I felt sad about the breakup or had to accept a new way of being, a way of life, it actually, like, felt good, you so, know, it's so like what sob. About, what about that grief? Was that grief a, a, a great teacher for you? Do you feel like you grew through the experience? Yeah, I do, because I feel like it was an acceptance of the ever-changing nature of this world that we're in, you know, like, like, we had been sort of like stagnant for a couple of years and I had just like been lashed onto this vision of my life with this person. And then the grief was like, ah, oh, <laughs> you gotta accept a new reality now, brother. You know, you gotta, you gotta let go of that other, the other vision, the other life, the other, and that the shedding actually felt pleasurable. Like I don't shedding, know how to describe like it. Like shedding a dead skin? Yeah, of. and like through crying and like after, I remember just like after like really intense like sobbing sessions, just like sitting there and being like, my body was like buzzing, almost like feeling good, you know, after like having... Washed by the tears. Exactly. So what, is, what does this bring up for all of you? I mean, do you, do you, what about those stories we've all heard like when someone says that cancer was the best thing that ever happened to mm. me? Or what, you know, the worst thing that I could have imagined when he left me or she left me, that was the best thing that ever happened because I would have never been, you know, where I am today or that, all that kind of It's hard because, like, it can be a very valid statement, but you have to get there in a way that actually feels important. It's really easy to say things like that and bypass. Yeah, or like, or like premature forgiveness. Right, yeah. Right. And so it's totally valid, and, you know, that's... I don't know if it's right to say that's where we want to be, but um, it's tricky to get there mm -hmm. in a really sincere way. Right. Mm -hmm. I often think too, like it's that consciousness that comes at the end of that song or that moment or that event, that healing. Like there, the, like your eyes just open a little bit more, mm -hmm. and kind of what you're saying too is like it, it sucks that something that big has to happen. But you start to realize what was I sleeping through? What was mm -hmm. I not aware of? What was I, how did I lose myself? Mm -hmm. Or how did I never know who myself was in those moments? And now I'm finding who I really am down there at my soul. Yeah. Do you feel like that's a gift from God? Sometimes. I think, some, I mean, I mean, it depends on the thing, because the, the event is cancer and the person dies, and I don't know. But, you know, I think that it's definitely an obstacle that's put in a path, whether that's breakup or cancer or whatever it may be. It's an obstacle put in your path for higher learning and for higher connection to divinity and to the self. There are different ways to die also. People die in different consciousness. They die in different versions of you die throughout your life, right. even if you are still alive. Yeah, dying before we die. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dying like, before we die, right? Like, I'm sure you're different now. Oh, yeah. Okay. The, last, the last three weeks, I've, like, have not, I've had no idea what to do with myself. Because I'm like, okay, here I am, freshly molted. <laughs> Everything is really sensitive right now, you know? I'm like, ah, what do I do? And this week was the first week that I actually started feeling, like, stretches of, like, myself again. And my word was going to be like pitta or like fire focus. Today I felt like very like, okay, I'm like on top of work. I'm like at the studio. I'm like doing the things I need to get done. And I'm like feeling like me again, you know? So yeah, there is, it's a, it's a complete, it's passing through the portal, you know, like shedding the outer skin, the outer layer. I really like that bouncing ball like analogy where it's like the bouncing ball like in the big like glass jar. And it's like as time passes, like that jar, that space grows larger. But it doesn't mean that you're still not going to grieve the various deaths that you've gone through, whether it's of yourself or it's of a loved one or it's whatever fear that you've had to pass through and stuff like that. Just personally, I know that it still surfaces, right? And I yeah. have had tendencies where I've judged them. I'm like, oh, I moved through that fear. I moved through that grief. Right. But then it resurfaces, and I'm like, it, it's helpful to know that the space just gets bigger, but it still can get hit. 
Right. I, you're reminding me of this, this uh, saying I read by one author. She was saying something about how she was thinking it's a good thing to be on speak, good speaking terms with your previous selves. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like it's still a part of you. Yeah. yeah. There's an entire branch of like psychology that dives into this concept. It's called internal family systems, where it like look it basically you name all the different parts of you, whether they're historical parts like the child Ethan or the teenage Ethan, or there are the identity based parts or whatever identities you know that are like mixing in community with us, you know. And so it was really cool. My therapist like. And I did it, and I literally was like, who's at my boardroom table? And I was like, okay, there's child Ethan, there's gay Ethan, there's spiritual Ethan. And they all have conversations, and spiritual Ethan represents like, okay, what's the Bhakti path say about this? Gay Ethan's like, what does the gay culture say about this? Child Ethan's like, what's the most fun thing to do? And then they all converse, and then the centered Ethan, my Atma, gets to decide, okay, this is how I want to move forward with things. Wow, that's really beautiful. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much. This is amazing. Anything else anyone wants to share? Yes. Wow. It kind of is interesting what you had said about, you know, we sometimes assume that we're supposed to end in a place of, oh, it's all like, it's all kind of aesthetic and cool. But I think that's also really real and human to accept that a lot of things are actually not. And it's okay to feel sadness and anger and things because a lot of us, I think, don't like to face our shadow selves. Um, we suppress them and then they come out in weird ways. Like, I know, you know, it's like when we don't want them to, instead of just accepting it, I think that the accepting is accepting that we also have all of that and it's totally valid and okay mm -hmm. to feel those things and feel upset and feel angry and angry and maybe you don't want to get over something um, but I think it's a matter of like the confronting that or just like, accepting that that's actually where you are in that moment in time and I'm not ready to, I'm not ready to give that up right now that's yeah. a part of me that I'm yeah. holding right now but maybe there will be a time when yeah. I'll see it in a different way that's beautiful what else? Um, say how much I love the neutrality of God and sometimes for me it's helpful to think about like when there is light or when there is this good feeling and this happiness that there has to be some shadow aspect of it mm. and kind of just accepting that both things are true always and um, something also that I've learned is that is this thing about the wave you know, like you, there is going, if you know that there's going to be an up, you know that there's going to be a down. So sometimes just accounting for the fact that you might come up, come face to face with something that doesn't feel good. And when you open up yourself to that vast experience, then maybe it doesn't hurt as much. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you, you're like, oh, this is here now, which means an up so is coming too. Yeah. Beautiful. Anybody else have any thoughts? I was just um, thinking, like, I lost my stepfather a couple of years ago, and it was like this huge grief. Like, a part of me was like, forever gone. Like, the child who was no longer, like, I was like, you're supposed to be the grown up now, and like, nobody was going to save me. Like, I had to figure things out on my own now. Like, Santa Claus died, basically. And it was like, so, like, I just cried so much, and I feel like I was raised to, like, not cry, you know, I was raised to, like, be strong, there's work to be done, and so, like, I feel so privileged now that I have the opportunity to agree, and no, not, you know, some people don't have that opportunity because they're working, they can't just sit around and cry for, like, two days, um, so I was just so grateful to have, like, the good as karma to like breathe properly and then like then it just passed and I like wasn't sad anymore so like what you had said I realized um, just like allowing like whatever and like that's fine to feel um, but I guess unfortunately for that young lady so I guess like it's a good reminder to ourselves if we're feeling that way to like maybe let the other person know like hey I'm, like just in a like tough spot right now 
not gonna show up like very well right now. So like, you need to work this out. And it's not about you necessarily. Yeah. So that, like, because sometimes it is hard to hold somebody that's like screaming in your face. You know, like why okay. you put yourself you through you. that? Yeah. Like, just like you don't have to do that. You can just walk away and like go have fun with your friends. So like sometimes it's so much work. Like it's so much love to hold somebody and embrace them while they're screaming at you and like they're maybe like totally have a misunderstanding of what you did, but they're so angry. Mm -hmm. And you're so angry at them that they could be so angry. They don't like they don't know you that much that they could think something like that. But you get so angry. And it just takes a lot of like like, you know, putting yourself together, like putting all of your like rooms together and just like holding the space until they're done. And, like they're gonna be open at some point. They're gonna let you speak at some point. But it's a lot of effort, I guess. Like a lot of love. So yeah. you know, to people. And you know, our culture is so based on just stuff it down. Don't mm -hmm. show it. Big girls don't cry, you know, just stuff it down. But grieving um, has to be expressed. But they're they're crying like you were saying, that crying is, those are healing tears. And um, someone who does a lot of grief work said something really beautiful, that only someone who can love very deeply is able to grieve deeply also. You're only able to grieve deeply if you're able to love deeply. So um, these are the gifts of, of love, the, you know, the grief and the joy. Those are the gifts of love. You know? So. Thank you all so much. This is so beautiful and rewarding to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.